What up, everybody? Adam here. Well, I guess we're living in the days of the coronavirus, and I wish I could tell you exactly what that meant, but it seems like we're all on a bit of a learning curve. Last week, you probably noticed that we canceled our much-anticipated Sing Together conference, and I just want to say a few things real quick while I have the chance. Number one, I just want to tell you I'm gutted by that decision. I know many of you were as well. We were really, really looking forward to that. It seemed like almost a divine moment to get all of these amazing people in the same room at the same time. And so I just want you to know that was not a decision that me or my team took lightly. But given some of the things that were happening in the world and given some of the potential that could happen here in our own country, it felt like the most responsible way to be a good neighbor to our country and to the city of Nashville. Second thing I want to say is just thank you. Thank you for signing up. And then also thank you for just being really kind and generous with us in the cancellation. You have been so uh, gracious to us. And I just want to tell you, I feel that. And then the third thing I want to say is Melissa and I are working already to get that rescheduled and on the books for 2021. So in the coming months, look for that. We'll try to make you aware. All right. Because we have canceled Sing Together, I just want to say, well, maybe this is a moment where you could come and join us at an event this fall. And we have three that might be just perfect for you. And I just want to quickly highlight those. Uh, Number one, we have two different Thrive events that are happening this fall. Thrive is like our all ages worship training. Think of it like continuing education. So if you're a new worship leader, it's a great moment for you. If you've been a worship leader for a long time, This is also a great moment for you to just come in and get reinvigorated and maybe learn a thing or two and maybe meet some new people in the Vineyard Tribe. We're doing one of those in Jersey and we're doing one in Kansas City. You can check out the details on our website. And then finally, we're also doing a National Worship Leaders Retreat in Colorado Springs, Colorado. You need to look at that. Normally, we do like four of those around the country. This year, we're just doing one. Uh, It's probably going to be a bit of a bigger event, and we have some amazing guests that are coming in, and it would be awesome to have you in the room. So look, if you can't come to sing together, and that's all of us, maybe we could meet you somewhere on the road this fall. We'd love to have you with us. Okay, this week's guest on the podcast is Mark Fields. Mark oversees really the missions arm, the missions movement for Vineyard USA. He has helped establish vineyard churches and really just a vineyard community, not just in one space, but globally. And you're going to hear that in his story. Uh, Mark is a really articulate man. Mark is a really kind and tender man. You're going to hear that in the conversation as well. I think you'll be moved. I think you'll be challenged, especially if you're someone who thought your life was going to go one way and you're finding that God might be inviting you into something really, really different. Mark's story just sort of resonates with that. All right. I hope you enjoy this conversation and look forward to seeing you somewhere on the road this fall. Peace. in my life was realizing that the group of people that I had been really hurt by had a similar accent, a different accent than my own. I remember I was actually in Mexicali in a large church that became part of the vineyard later with one of my best friends, who's a Puerto Rican guy, Santos Ramos, and he, see now I get emotional again, he was a very powerful moment for both of us. We were praying for each other and he said, you know, I've really been wounded by people who have an accent like yours. And I suddenly realized that I had been wounded by people who had an accent similar to his. And it was just a real moment of praying for each other and it deepened our relationship and really created healing. And so in some ways that was almost an obstacle because there just had been people who had been painful for me in that context. And so actually it was almost the opposite. It's incredible how the spirit brings the healing in the perfect way. You're listening to the Ferment Podcast, conversations about worship and transformation. Today's guest is Mark Fields. Mark is a church planter, a pastor, and the current director of global and intercultural ministry for Vineyard USA.
This episode is brought to you by our friends at worshipteam.com. Worshipteam.com comes preloaded with over 12,000 songs, with new songs being added all the time. Hillsong, Bethel, Vineyard, Six Steps, Jesus Culture, just to name a few. Service building with Worship Team is a snap, and all the songs are completely legal and licensed. You can also find them on social media, Facebook at worshipteam.com, Twitter at worshipteam, Instagram at worshipteam underscore WT. Visit them at worshipteam.com for a free trial today. Complete worship planning with thousands of songs, easy interface, mobile apps, and legal rights for your church. All you need in one place, worshipteam.com. Hey, good morning, Mark. Good morning. Hey, we are in sunny San Diego. It's kind of nice. Actually, it's not sunny right now. Uh, listen, I have Kentucky eyes, and, and I know what it is like right now in my home state. This is sunny, and it's beautiful. Anyway, it is really cool to sit with you this morning, and i uh, been wanting to have this conversation for more than a minute. Uh, if you don't know, can you just tell everybody who you are and what you do in the vineyard? So my role is to oversee the international work of the U.S. Vineyard Churches. And so we're working in, to plant churches in about 80 countries around the world, and I coordinate that effort. Oh, it sounds like a, a really small job, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm sure that keeps you more than busy. Um, I want to jump into that, but before we do that, maybe we could just do some personal history. Why don't you tell us where you're from and uh, maybe what kind of family you grew up in and, and what was your faith story in your early years or if or was there one yeah so i'm a native californian i grew up about two hours north of here and i have a single i have one sister so yeah. it's just two of us she's two years younger than me and my family attended the baptist church did you guys always attend church was it like that was just what your family did yeah you know my dad in particular was pretty nominal in his faith but yeah. we always showed up in church and so it was not a super healthy family. So I left when I was 17. I joined the Navy. I was actually stationed here in San Diego for a while and then up the road wow. at Camp Pendleton. And that was where an adult relationship with God emerged. Okay. So when you left, was God something that was in your heart and mind? Or was there something about the life situation and circumstances of being in the Navy that sort of drew that to the surface? Yeah, so it was always kind of in the back of things. But what happened was I was stationed at the Naval Hospital here in San Diego, which is not far from us. And I was working in a surgery ward as a corpsman. And um, there was a guy who was there and he was dying of cancer. And he was a storekeeper chief and was in his mid 50s, which was much older than me at that time. And I sat there and watched him die. And I was 18. I had never seen anyone die. And suddenly my own mortality is right in my face. And that just prompted a whole series of questions about what really matters and what is life and what is death. And, and so I went to the church for those answers because that's what I'd grown up in. And so I went to the conservative Baptist church that was closest. And that didn't really result in me finding what I was looking for. And then through a series of events, I came across Calvary Chapel. And that's where I did find something that was much more what I was looking for. Yeah. And when you say it was something much more of what you were looking for, what, what was that? Can you so, define that? Yeah, so first of all, some of it was the externals. I mean, I had I grew up singing hymns, which were very unfamiliar to me. Yeah. I have zero musical capacity. I think, as I mentioned <laughs> to you, I was thrown off the, uh, yeah. the, the youth choir in the sixth grade because yeah. I couldn't sing. And so the hymns and holding the book and watching the song leader was pretty foreign to me. But when I went to Calvary Chapel, the songs were like the music that I listened to on the radio. So the first appeal was, was that there wasn't a huge cultural gap. People dressed like I dressed. People were my age. People listened to music that had to do with God that was much more similar to what I had chosen to do outside of church. And so that's what drew me. And then I found people who were really being deeply transformed by the work of God. And I, I needed that. Yeah. So did you stay in the Navy or were you like, okay, I got to get out of the Navy and do something different? Yeah. So I got out early. It was through circumstances that it's a long story. And I had intended to go to medical school. That was my goal when I got out, which is why I was a corpsman, which is like a medic. Um, and God had other plans. And all of a sudden I found myself involved in planting a church. And in those days, Calvary Chapel, they had had a 
church planting training program. It had been two weeks in length, but they decided that that was too much. And so they had cut it down to one week. And <laughs> Let's so, get these people out the door. And so I drove down to Costa Mesa to the Maranatha Evangelical Association and had a week of training in church planting. And we planted the church that became Calvary Chapel of Claremont and then the Vineyard Pomona. Okay, and was that your church? Were you planting your church, or were you helping someone else? There were there was a group of people who were starting that, and so my initial role was not as the senior pastor, but I was there. I was the associate pastor, and then the senior pastor left, and it was a huge shift. He was at that time uh, 40. He's Cuban, an immigrant. I was 20 and white, and so that created some tension in that change in the church, which I was too naive to understand what that meant. And so I found myself as the senior pastor at 22. I'd been married three months. I had been 22 for one month and I had done one sermon and <laughs> I'm now leading this church. <laughs> yes. Oh. Laughter is the hey, appropriate response. Yeah, you, you look, they look around and they're like, hey, Mark, you've preached once, right? How'd you like to be the pastor? It was like there was no one else standing, and so I was the only one left. So it Oh, was... it's amazing. Well, I, I do wonder this, though. You said that the first pastor was 40 years old, and he was Cuban. He was an immigrant. Were there, were there other people? Was it a diverse community? Or was it, or was he sort of the outlier in the community? No, because, uh, because he was Latino, he drew a, yeah. a, a much larger population of folks who were more culturally similar to him. So it was mixed. Okay. Even you know, from the beginning. Yeah. Okay. And so it wasn't an, yeah. And then it, that was pretty much sustained through the whole history of the church. We became much more intentional about being multicultural later on, but from the beginning that the church was. Well, I, I wonder this too, it just makes me have this sort of question, knowing what you do now, you know, you're helping the vineyard think about missions all over the world. I'm wondering if that experience isn't in some ways like the seeds of some of what you've done working cross-culturally. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. Or, I don't know. Yeah. I mean, I think actually the call to what I'm doing now goes back further than that. Okay. That's a part of the story. Sometimes I'm a little amazed when I think about it and I recognize how God built pieces in. So even my time in the Navy, I was a sailor. I was stationed with Marines and you go to field medical service school and it just, it's designed to give you emergency medicine skills to a higher degree than you had been trained in previously, but the other half of that school is to train you to be with the Marines. And you learn the nomenclature, you learn the rank, you learn how the Marines function. And I realized that at 18, I was getting my first training in how to enter a culture that was different than my own. But even before that, when I was in the Baptist church, um, we had two annual events. One was an eschatology conference with a large <laughs> banner across the front showing the charts. dispensations. Yes, yes exactly. Yes. A and, charts conference. And, and, you know, we had our Schofield Bibles where the notes and the verses were indistinguishable. Uh, yes. And then we had a missions conference. And so when I was about 12, I walked forward and committed my life to missions. And so, no way. and so. Is that the Lottie Moon? Conference? I, I was conservative Baptist. Okay, Lottie dude. Moon is Southern Baptist. Okay, so there we go. See, my some, Kentucky roots were showing yeah, here in just a little bit. So, yeah, but a similar sort of thing. And then right after that, my parents started separating and my family fell apart. And so a call to mission seemed to be sort of back burner. And it was like 25 years later when I was in my mid-30s that God, that God took me up on that. Uh -huh. And it felt very much like still makes me cry. Yeah, he, you're emotional. He he took very seriously what that 12-year-old boy committed. Yeah, that's amazing. And came and said, okay, now's the time to do that. Yeah. And so that's what started a more direct line into what I'm doing now. Mark, you, you uh, as soon as you had that thought, it, it made you very emotional. So you carry that deeply with you. Huh? When you were 12, what did that feel like? Because like, if you're going forward, what were you... What were you responding to? Do you, do you remember? Yeah, I mean, it was a, I, I mean, it was sort of, I was like the last one to go up, you know, and yeah. I mean, altar calls, you know how they work in, That's the, right. in the Baptist church. You know, there's one more and, yeah. you know, and this was a call to commit to missions. 
And so it was, I don't think they were singing just as I am, but it was some variation of that. I mean, it was in Grace Baptist Church in Glendora, like two hours north of here. I remember exactly where it was. Wow. And there was just this sense of, it was a commitment to be about God's work in the world. Wow. That's, a, that's incredible. Especially that you would hear that, feel that as a 12 year old. And then all of these things would happen for maybe many years and you'd even be in ministry, but the real culmination of that may not happen until you were in your mid thirties. That's kind of brilliant. And I have a feeling that I made a lot of promises to God growing up, you know, I mean, I went to youth camp and there was always the thing and you throw the log in the fire and you made some promise to God. I don't remember any of those, <laughs> but I never forgot that. You don't remember the sins you nailed to a cross or anything? I don't want to remember. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, that's, that's really, really great. It's a powerful story. Um, I'm, I'm also wondering when you were pastoring, let's, we can just maybe jump back into that. You're in your early 20s. The Hispanic pastor leaves. You take over. Fairly multicultural situation. Was missions a part of your thinking at that point? No. You were just doing the pastor gig. Yeah, I was just trying to survive. Like, like again, there was no preparation. I mean, I had gone to Calvary Chapel's Bible school by then, but that was like two 10-week things and so had some element of foundation but it just it doesn't prepare for what the reality is and so a lot of the folks that were latino left because i was not sufficient age and i'm really white and yeah. and and i had really actually been been hurt in all of that and one of the healing moments in my life was was um realizing that that a group of people that I had been really hurt by had a similar accent, a different accent than my own. I remember I was actually in Mexicali in a large church that became part of the vineyard later with one of my best friends who's a Puerto Rican guy, Santos Ramos. And he, see now I get emotional again. He was a very powerful moment for both of us. We were praying for each other. And he said, you know, I've really been wounded by people who have an accent like yours. And I suddenly realized that I had been wounded by people who had an accent similar to his. And it was just a real moment of praying for each other. And it deepened our relationship and really created healing. And so in some ways, that was almost an obstacle because I don't want to go into all the details, but there just had been people who yeah. had been painful for me in that context. And so actually, it was almost the opposite but that's, a, that's incredible how the spirit brings the healing in the perfect way yeah yeah okay so how many years did you pastor in so Pomona? 21 okay did that when you were pastoring did that feel like oh this is what i'm called to do this is my space because this is before you're doing like worldwide missions or leading this for the vineyard how did that feel totally uh, i mean i my intention was to retire in that church i had no desire to be anywhere else. We planted nine churches out of there. And so we, God had spoken really clearly that what went out from us would be more than what was there. And so like one of those churches, the first one we planted, which is why we were Calvary Chapel, is actually a mega church. Like it runs about 8,000 on Sunday morning as part of the Calvary Chapel system, but came out of what God did in that group of folks. I was too immature to understand that God was calling him to something else. And so there was conflict and it was kind of a narrowly averted church split. So, but, but whatever it planted. And so yeah. then we became much more intentional about planting churches after that. Okay. So I never intended to be anywhere else, but there. Yeah. So you're, you're in Southern California, you're planting churches. This is great, but I know, the, at least some of your story sitting here because you're you now help the vineyard plant churches uh, in an international context when did that happen or when when did when did you wake up to that or how did you get that call because i don't think i know that story yeah so so i just i started being much more aware of people different than me around i mean southern california has a lot of ethnic diversity. And so I, we had moved from Claremont, which is a, a more upscale um, college community to Pomona because Claremont wouldn't let us build or have a building there. We didn't build, we rented. And so we couldn't have space and we were growing and we needed a facility. And Pomona is a much more multicultural community at that time. A group called Zero Population Growth had identified it as the second most stressful urban environment in the nation after Miami. And so all of a sudden we're in a very different context and my eyes start to get open. 
my dissertation, if you read the acknowledgments, those are all people of color. And so God brought a guy to the church who, who was, uh, his father was uh, African-American, his mom was Japanese, his dad had been killed in a racial uh, murder in the South and when he was in the army. He was a dean at one of the Claremont colleges and he began to take me under his wing and answer really foolish and ignorant questions. Um, Santo Ramos, who I mentioned earlier, I yeah. sat with him and listened to some of his story. And all of a sudden, I'm aware that there's people around me that don't have the same experience that I have. And so I began to explore that. I went to Fuller. My first class at Fuller was ministering to Asian Americans. So there were 40 Asian Americans and me. And I'm kind of tall and white, and so I stand out. <laughs> yeah. And so everybody's like, why are you in this class? Yeah, well, you know? Mark, are you 6'4", six, 6'3"? Four, six, yeah, I'm, well, I probably with age have shrunk, but I used to be 6'5". So, oh, there you go, 6'4". So, we're going to call it 6'5". So five. I'm going to still there, claim that. You should. In faith. Yeah, so you're you you're 6'5", white guy in a class of Asians at Fuller, and this is the next the next iteration of what the spirit is doing in your yeah. life. Yeah, my uh, con it was. I did an MA in theology there, and my concentration was multicultural ministry. I was the first white guy to do that concentration at Fuller, and then I began to be invited into doing things first on the local basis. And I remember being invited to a gathering of Latino pastors from the vineyards. So there are only five or six: Richard Ochoa, Gujo Castaño, some of these early guys. And Bob Fulton had convened the meeting, and at the end of the meeting, Bob said, "I, I." I've got too much to do. I really can't continue this gathering. So Mark is now going to lead on my behalf. Well, they had no idea who I was. And this was Bob Fulton who had been convening this. And so one of the guys, Joe Castaños, goes, who the heck are you? Yeah. And I said, well, maybe we can have lunch together and you can find out. And then that built a friendship that he and I ended up traveling all over Latin America together. And and so there were just a series of steps. And so then I became the regional missions person for Southern California. And then shortly after Wimber died under Todd, I was asked to take the national role. Yeah. So there's just moment by moment, God keeps giving you more, uh, more scope to your ministry. But then I'm also hearing more and more interaction with people who are really different than you. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the other thing I hear in your story is this. And, and you can tell me if I'm wrong here, but what I'm, what I think I'm hearing is the spirit is at work in your life. You're coming into contact with people who are really different than you. Uh, you're waking up to the African-American experience. You're waking up to the Latino experience. And then if I'm hearing your story right, it sounds like once you kind of get into this awakening, you go to school, like you know, you're not just having human experiences and listening to stories, but there's something in you that's like, okay, I need to go to Fuller. What, what, what's that about, Mark? Have you always been bent towards education? Yes. Okay. So, so, so I love education, but I have, like, I have no bachelor's degree. <laughs> So, so, okay. So talk to me about that. Cause well, I know you've got a PhD or two floating around and a bunch of other degrees. Well, I was a part of Calvary Chapel and you know, they, I, you, you heard constantly, you want to go to cemetery. I mean, seminary, yeah. you know, so there was not a value for education and the rapture was going to happen any moment. So why, why would go? you waste money on a four year process when we're liable to be here for weeks? And so I was a part of a church culture that, that, that reduced an emphasis on education. And yet I'm a learner. And so I love to learn, which is why I do all the education that I do. It comes pretty easy for me. And so I know that I, I mean, there's a difference between hearing and interacting and reading. Like I read a lot and I appreciate reading and I have a large library and I've read most of the books and that's a really important part of my life. It's different, however, hearing it and being able to interact with people who have expertise. And so I knew that. And so the, the going to Fuller was about trying to say, I, I need to learn this. I'm finishing some... I'm finishing a master of theology in Orthodox theology, like Eastern Orthodox theology. So I finished all the coursework. I've done the residencies. I've done my internships and I have 20 pages left to write on my thesis. So that will be done this week. So probably yeah. and this, is current. I mean, this month, yeah, yeah this like is current. right now, I will yeah. write that this month. Yeah. So, so there's something in you that's, that is deeply connected, not just to missions and to people who are different or even church ministry, but there's something about your story that's deeply connected to being a lifelong learner. Yeah. 
Yeah. And I want to interact with difference. I mean, if I just sit in the echo chamber, I'm, I'm not stretched. And so I, it's, it's valuable to be around things that even are, are, are startlingly different because otherwise it's difficult to expand your thinking and view. Well, and I guess I, I wonder, is that why you are studying Orthodox theology right now? Just it's, it's yeah, what, what happened such is... Such a left turn from like maybe vineyard, vineyard understandings of the world. Actually, I don't think it is a far left turn from vineyard understandings of the world at all. So, so my interest in Orthodox theology goes back to probably about 1980. And there, there was a bookstore. Yeah, you're laughing, see, that's... No, I love, I love all, seeing it's it's this, 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 Your stories are dramatically consistent. <laughs> so, so there was this bookstore that developed near Fuller in Pasadena as an alternative to Fuller Bookstore. So they, they would sell at full price and archives sold used books and gave a 20% discount far before Amazon. So I was looking around in the books. This was before I went to Fuller and my education came through reading, self-teaching. And I saw this book called The Mystical Theology of the Eastern Church by Vladimir Lasky. And I loved the title of that. I had no idea there was an Eastern Church, but the idea of a mystical experiential theology was incredibly interesting to me. And so I bought that and I read that book and I understood maybe 10%, maybe, maybe. And, but I knew, I understood two things. One is that they argue that experience, my experience with God can and probably should impact my theology. And that's one of the places where it intersects with the vineyard, yeah. is we understand that our experience of God has an impact on how we understand God. And I would argue it should, and I would argue that denying that is probably not helpful, but embracing that and recognizing how that works is super helpful. That's the reason why we have words like expectation in our vineyard formation, right? Yeah. And encounter and... Yes. and I mean, worship obviously is a huge place where that yeah, that's happens. Right. And then the other thing is, is he talked about the image of God, people being created in the image of God. And I was just gripped by that. Like I had never heard that. And I began to think about what does it mean that human beings are created in God's own image? And I don't know that I understood a lot, but I knew that that meant that people had value. And so we had been very involved in our church in ministry with the poor in the coming years and people on the margins. And I remember when I was looking around at other models of what people had done, because that's how I learned to compare and contrast. And I saw things where people were given material goods for, quote, free, but there was actually a cost, and the cost was really a lot greater than money. It was their dignity. Mm. And it just really grated against me, and I think largely because I had this clear sense that people created in the image of God have value. Every human being has value. And so I held that for a long time, and that impacted me rather deeply, And but I, I didn't explore that. And then probably now, let's see, I've been in this program three years, so it's probably three years before that. So probably about six years ago, I decided that I just really needed to binge on Eastern Orthodox theology, because it's a different way of doing theology. Why did you make that decision? I was there a life I, circumstance? I think there was just a sense that, I mean, I've studied a lot of Western theology. I enjoy that. I'm, I'm back doing that now in another, I'm actually in a program in Ignatian spirituality. But I just, I, that draw was always there. And so I had begun to read and it was really stretching for me because they do theology differently and they what, think what do, differently. What do you mean they do theology differently? I mean, there's no systematic theology in the Orthodox Church. PTL. You know, <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, and That's and, just my own personal bent. Yeah, no. that's great. And I know... Some people get mad at me because I don't like systematic theology. And I, it's not that I don't like theology. It's, I mean, first of all, I believe every theology is contextual. Yeah. So to imagine that there is the systematic theology that is universal is not how I understand things. So yeah. most of that comes out of a Western, North American, or European context. And the problem is, is to imagine that God is limited by my capacity to understand God is kind of... That's hugely problematic. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> it's hard to see that as God if God's limited by my intellect, however great or small that is. Yeah. So I 
began to read a lot in, in Orthodox spirituality. I found things that were really personally helpful to me. I began to pray the Jesus prayer. Mm. And then I thought... For well, people who don't know, will you just... What is the Jesus prayer? So the Jesus prayer, there's a couple of versions, but it's basically, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. That's the longer version. And there's a tradition that's been retained primarily in the Eastern Church, but it dates back at least to um, the third or fourth century, where there's just a repetition of that with reflection on each of those words. And it's become very powerful for me. And I've realized that the, the, the cry for mercy is sort of the Swiss army knives of prayer. When I don't know how to pray, that's what I pray because the mercy of God seems to answer most every need. Yeah. Amen. And uh, what I like about the Jesus prayer, because I did know, I do know a little bit about it is it's so portable, you know, you, you, like little kids can know that and memorize it, take it with them. Um, people who are extremely stressed, or as, as you say, when I don't know how to pray, I can connect with this little thing. Yeah. Yeah. It's beautiful. And it's an incredibly rich prayer. I mean, Lord, Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. I mean, there's a lot there. And so to reflect on each of those things speaks to primarily who God is, but also who I am in relationship to God, and then acknowledges my need and asks for the mercy that God gives. Maybe we could take a little turn here in our conversation. You are helping the vineyard think about churches and expansion throughout the globe. And you've been doing that for more than a minute. What's happening right now? Because, you know, there, there may be people who are listening to this who are somewhat aware of what's happening right now. But there's probably a lot of people who are listening to this who are maybe just leading worship at a vineyard church somewhere. Or maybe they're just, you know, maybe they're just a part of a church somewhere. And they're, they're not even completely aware that the vineyard is doing things around the world. Just what's happening? Yeah. So in terms of the big picture, there are vineyard churches or church planting efforts in 108 countries right now. Amazing. So depending on how you count, there are basically 200 nations in the world. And so there are vineyard churches now in more than half of those. And out of that 108, there are 80 of those countries currently where... It's U.S. Vineyard Churches are the ones going over and engaged in helping to plant churches there. And so the goal is to see a, a movement of vineyard churches emerge in that nation that's self-governing, self-propagating, and self-financing, and that becomes a peer with the vineyard U.S. In, in the global vineyard world and has their own leadership, contextualizes their theology, the practices, and sees the kingdom expand through this part of God's work in the world called the vineyard. Yeah, Mark, is there an area of the world that is particularly moving right now in terms of church planting with the vineyard? Or is it sort of just kind of all over? Or is it, you know, because I would imagine there's moments where certain places get momentum and... Yeah. Yeah. A few years ago, when, when Phil Strout became our national director, and he was in the in-between time of transition between Burt Wagner and Phil, Phil spoke at a conference, I think it was actually in Nashville, the mm. leadership team meeting. 
And he wanted to share the platform that morning. Bert had spoken that evening and Phil was on the next morning. And so Phil asked if I would have a small piece of that time. And he said to me, um, Mark, I, I don't want a story. I can do stories fairly well and have lots of those. He said, I don't want a story. He goes, I want a biblical theology of mission and I want um, a, a goal for the future. And you have four minutes. Thank you. <laughs> so <laughs> yes. I, I went away that night and I thought, what am I going to do? And so I picked a verse from Genesis and a verse from Revelation. So that was my biblical theology yeah, mission. Yeah. Cover to cover. And, and the goal. And at that time, we had seen planted about 800 churches around the world out of our efforts. And I thought, okay, so the next goal for the next 10 years, let's, let's make it 800 more. And then I thought, well, gosh, we have momentum and things are doing well in Brazil. And you know, I had to, I had to expand that a little bit, so 1,000. And then at that point, I thought, well, maybe I ought to actually pray about this. And so I... I my intent was to offer God the choices of 800 or 1,000 and then go out the next morning and announce whichever one of those I felt most drawn to. And God, as God does, pick neither of those options. And I heard God speak as distinctively as I ever have. You've learned to plant hundreds of churches, you being the vineyard, not me personally. Now I want you to learn to plant thousands. And I had no idea what to do with that, actually for like two and a half or three years. And I was on a retreat at Indian Nation Retreat Center near San Francisco. And, and it, there was a point where God just spoke very clearly. I'd been there, it was eight days, as I said, and I think I was on day six. And, and all of a sudden I knew what to do with that word that God had given me two or three years before. And I began a journey of learning about a church planning movements. And so I spent two years going around and looking at church planning movements. All right, can you tell tell people what that means? Because so that, that, that's, that's internal jargon, right? Okay, so yeah. places where the church is growing rapidly yeah. and they are actually being used by God to plant thousands of churches. And one of those was what's being called disciple-making movements. And that emerged out of some things in East, uh, East Africa. And they tend to use the language of disciple making, which is the process rather than church planting, which is the product, the church. And there are some principles to that, which are quite interesting. And so we began to integrate that into what we were doing. I am getting to your question. No, no, this and, is great. This is really and cool. And so as it's not the only thing that we do, but it does seem to be something on which God is working. And so one of the places where things are happening is West Africa in the Ivory Coast. And there are now hundreds of discovery groups that use a process of simple Bible study in which they read the scriptures together, they speak out what they hear God speaking to them particularly, and what they hear God inviting them to obey, and then who they're going to tell about that, and there's some accountability. And we're watching that work grow to 11, it's over 11 generations now. So one group plants, another group plants, another group plants, another group plants, yeah. another group, out to 11 generations generations, a couple hundred villages, which are all Muslim background, no Christian presence, have a work of God there. And they're now in two previously unreached people groups Amazing. in that country and moving north. So that would be one example of where things are really growing. Well, you know what I love about what you just said? Um, that weird little emphasis there, uh, read the Bible together in order to hear what, what I can obey. That's that's kind of amazing. I think a lot of American churches would do well to do that. I do too. You know, rather than just sermonizing. And by the way, I am a preacher. I sermonize. I, I believe in that. But yeah, the, what, a, what a wonderful way to engage the life of the church, to read it together. I, I heard you say the word together and to, and to listen for what can we obey. Wow. And it is powerful. And people critique DMM, which is disciple making movements for, you know, like who's going to teach them, but you have the Bible and you have the Holy Spirit and you have community. Like those are sort of not that dissimilar from Wesleyan's quadrilateral. I was getting ready to say that's, it sounds darn Wesleyan, doesn't and it? Yeah. God gets stuff done. Amazing. Amazing. So that is, uh, you said that's West Africa. Has that been something that's been happening in the last little while, or is that? Yeah. So that's we have, do, we last... have a, do we have a historic work there as well? No, no. That's in the last boy, time blurs. Yeah. I don't know, four or five years. I mean, it's Amazing. it's relatively brief. I don't want to say the country, but there's there's a, a guy sent out of a vineyard church 
actually that doesn't exist anymore, but it's not was not far from where we sit now. And in that country, in Central Asia, he's seen over a thousand people come to Christ in, in about a two year period using the same principles. That's it's beautiful. just amazing. Out That's of a beautiful. single people group, and it's one person telling another person and inviting them to a process of reading God's word and asking what God might be speaking to them today. And so also kind of what I hear in that story as well is uh, somehow these groups start or whatever, but then if the group is planting a group, you said 11 generations a moment ago, then that means it's, it's peer to peer, right? It isn't, it isn't just dependent on uh, a white guy or a white guy from a white gal from America coming over. Right. right. At, at some point it's, it becomes contagious within yep. that, in, that local community. That's exactly right. And so it's a little risky. And again, people criticize that because like, who's controlling this? Well, it's God that's controlling this. Yeah. Like, like, yeah, beautiful. That's really beautiful. I, I, I love that story. I really do. All right, Mark. Hey, listen, um, here's what we're going to do. Uh, we normally ask one question here at the end of the podcast. And uh, the second season, we have a new question. And um, it can be just like top of mind awareness or whatever. But I would love for people to know uh, before we get off of here, I'd love for people to know what you're hoping for or what you're dreaming about these days. Well, I mean, I guess there's two pieces to that. So one side of that is for the vineyard. And my time is, I mean, I can see the horizon where I move out of the role. I mean, that's, that's visible now. And I really want to hand off something healthy. Yeah. And uh, John Wimber said, a, you know, had a vision of 10,000 churches. And I would love to see us reach that before oh. I end, Amen. you know? Amen. I mean, we're somewhere above 3,000 and it's multiplying. And so that could actually happen. Yeah. So that's what I would like to see for the vineyard yeah. is, is 10,000 healthy churches. Personally, I want to end well. I, I, I want to end this season still loving Jesus, still loving the church, still loving people, not cynical. Um, it's pretty clear to me what the next phase in my life is going to be about. And so I'm excited about that. But I, I need to get to the point where that happens. And I'm quite convinced that that leaders get into trouble when they try to expand further at this juncture in their lives that I'm sort of at. And I think that for most people, maybe for everyone, the answer is going deeper with fewer and investing in folks. And so I'm developing skills to really make sure that I'm able to try to pass on what I know and understand and experience to as many people as God opens that door for. Oh, that's beautiful. That's really beautiful. And by the way, I just want to say cosign on that. Uh, hoping to end by loving God and people yeah. <laughs> really well. Cosign, uh, same. Oh man, Mark, thank you. Thank you for what you do. And uh, thanks for talking with us this morning. Great to be here. With you. All right. This is Melissa Keller, Events Director for Vineyard Worship. If you've been enjoying the podcast, I've got a couple of ways you could really help us. First of all, review the podcast on iTunes or the podcast platform of your choice. This helps more people find us. Also, connect with us on social media, Instagram at The Ferment Podcast and Twitter at Fermentcast. Thanks for listening. See you next time.